Secretary of the Fort Thomas Planning Commission hereby certify that he attached a true copy of this notice of public hearing being held on Wednesday, July 20th, 2022, 6.30 p.m. at the Fort Thomas Community Center, 801 Cochran Avenue, Fort Thomas, Kentucky, to consider a stage one development plan for a single family home development located at 370, 380, and 383 Newman Avenue, 509 Main Avenue, 184 Highview Drive. Drew's home applicant. The notice was properly posted as required by KRS 100.212 at 370, 380, and 383 Newman Avenue, 509 Main Avenue, and 184 Highview Drive, Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Thank you, ma'am. And the way we'll do things, our developer will make a presentation. The city will make a few comments. Commission members will ask the developers questions that we may need to know after the presentation. Then we'll open it to the public for uh, comment. If you are a group, I ask that you have one designated person comes forward and speaks at the microphone for us. It is recorded. Uh, if you have an issue that somebody before you has already talked about, we will need to come through at the end because we keep track of all of them and we just log them in. So thank you for attendance. And we were here basically to educate you. Because I think that's always the main concern of what's really going to happen. And once you see what's going to happen, uh, sometimes that eases our fear of the unknown. So I ask our developers to uh, actually, uh, Dan, I, think we, I was just going to introduce and then you did a great job of uh, kind of the order in which we're going to do it. Actually, we're going to start with our um, engineer. They have reviewed the development plan submittal to us. They review that based on our zoning ordinance. So we have a very strict set of regulations associated with any development in the city. And um, CT consultants, Frank uh, Tweed Hughes is here to represent uh, us as far as that review. Um, they, there are certain things that we look at associated with this development, with any development, and uh, Frank will explain that. That will be followed by um, the applicant coming up to speak, and then as uh, Dan said, there'll be some questions from our board, and then we'll obviously open up uh, to, to the public. So Frank, if you'd like to get started. Thank you, Kevin. 
Can you raise your hand? submitted a stage one preliminary plan for the city. Uh, and they are requesting feedback on a proposed uh, on a proposed plan to create 26 residential lots. Uh, 24 lots will accommodate 24 new single family detached homes. Two of the proposed lots are currently occupied by a single family detached home, which will remain. Speed water, please. Sure. So the site consists of six parcels. 370 Newman, 380 Newman, 283 Newman, 509 Main, 184 Highview, and then an existing lot that is located at the end of Highview. Uh, that total acreage is 27.15 acres. Uh, the existing conditions is that uh, there's three existing single family homes spread across these six parcels. So of the six parcels, three and a half of the parcels are zoned R1D. Uh, and I can, I'll go over the requirements of an R1D, so here in just a second. So the total R1D acreage is 16.96 acres. Uh, two and a half lots are zoned R1B, as in full. Those are, that total acreage is 10.17, which then adds up to the 27.15 acres. Uh, so the minimum development standards for an R1D uh, lot, which will basically consist of lots 1 through 23 and 25. So the minimum lot area, as it's currently zoned today, is 13,000 square feet. Uh, the minimum lot width at the setback line is 85 feet. The minimum front yard depth is 30. Side yard is 10, and rear yard is 40. So for the parcels that um, are part of the R1B, which is lots 24 and 26, the minimum lot area is half of the 13,000, it's 7,500. Sorry, that's not half. Uh, yeah, the minimum lot width is 65 foot. The uh, minimum front yard depth is 30, side yard is 9, and rear yard is 35. So for it, the lots that are zoned R1D, uh, based on the total acreage that is on there, uh, a gross density, which does not include the publicly dedicated street, would allow for 56 homes. For the lots that are zoned R1B, the gross density would allow for 59 homes. Uh, again, that's the way that it's currently zoned today, and that does not accommodate any publicly dedicated street or any concerns for no side accommodations. Uh, so, uh, and again, the, the applicant is proposing 26 residential lots. So one major area of concern that we have noted in our review is that each lot shall front on at least 25 feet onto a publicly dedicated street. Uh, you speak louder? Yeah, you're not here. Can you speak louder? Speak up front. Speak louder. Speak loud like you don't have a microphone. That would be a good way to do it. The mic would speak loud like you So how much of this was heard? So there's, a, there's an area of concern with the stage one preliminary plan, and that's the fact that there is a lot that's proposed, it's lot, it's lot 25, that does not have 25 feet of frontage onto a publicly dedicated street. Uh, currently, that parcel has no frontage at all. Uh, however, with any kind of modification to the parcel which is being proposed, they're proposing to modify the parcel line, that lot currently has to come into conformance. So in order to come into conformance, it requires a 25-foot frontage onto a public, publicly dedicated street. Uh, other areas to consider uh, as the subdivision plan continues into detailed design is that there are a number of flag lots that consist of lots 11, 12, 13, 24, and 26. Each of those also need to maintain 25-foot frontage. Uh, and then the last thing that is part of my report that was submitted to the city is that all requirements for a preliminary plan 
uh, of the subdivision ordinance are submitted in addition to a table that includes the lot area, lot width, and frontage for each lot. And that includes the library. Thank you, Frank. Um, you may have represented from Greece. Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Not at all. Okay, I'll try to talk really loud and I'll be right in my um, My name is Matt Haynes. I'm with Trees Holmes, 211 Grandview Drive. Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, again, we want to make sure everyone understands what we're presenting. Uh, I want to stress that as we move forward with the state one plan, this is our plan that we're moving forward with. Uh, so it's not uh, we're not going to change it. We're not going to uh, modify it. Uh, this is the plan that we plan to move forward with. If we were to make any changes, then we have to come back and do this again. And that is not our intention. So I know there's a lot of concern about that. Um, those numbers that get out there for density, that would concern me too. And uh, that is definitely not what we want to do. Uh, we're moving forward with this number of lots. Uh, so uh, just once I have an opportunity, I would. Uh, take any questions and um, if you could just please move forward next slide. So just to familiarize everyone, this is the 27.15 acres highlighted in earth, outlined in red. Um, it is off of Newman Avenue, right across from the Gettysburg Square Apartments. Um, and again, it, it sort of borders high view. And then there's the one existing house in the northeast corner that is off of Maine. Next slide. So, um, just to reiterate the zoning, so it, it is split between R1D and R1B. So we are just going to go with the more stringent of the two, which is the R1B standard. Um, we're not really looking at density and how many houses we're here, where uh, the zoning really dictates uh, what size lot you have to have, the setbacks that you, that you need, and we're adhering to all the current zoning. So we're not asking for any changes from the zoning. We are sticking with the uh, county plan and uh, part of the reason we did this, I know uh, some people approached the brokerage firm, wanted higher density, uh, wanted more lots, uh, wanted to push the uh, envelope quite a bit more. And I, I think for us, just from not only aesthetics, what we want to build, this is more sensitive to the, uh, to the area there, to the topo. We didn't want to get into the steep hills uh, just because uh, it's just not appropriate for this site in our opinion. So we wanted to stick with the current zoning, which is a 13,000 square foot lot, 85 foot minimum lot width, 30 foot front setback from the right away, and 10 yard meaning minimum side yard setbacks and 40 rear yard setbacks. Next slide, please. So off of the new road, off of Newman Avenue, we are proposing 21 85 foot wide lots and then two 100 foot wide flag lots and then one 85 foot wide lot off of high view, and then keeping the two existing homes. I understand uh, the, uh, the lot, the existing home in the northeast corner there, uh, it, it's kind of a conundrum for us because it, it's really isolated, it's steep to get down to it, and it really has no connection, so there's an existing access easement for that lot, and it's a non-conforming lot right now, so what we're asking for is that it just be split off and separated. And um, if there's a way to do that, I, I'm certainly open to it. Uh, but you know, what we're proposing primarily are these 24 new lots and, and the two existing lots. Next slide, please. Uh, so the utilities, it's always a question. We want to make sure the utilities are available. So the water is available right on Newman Road. There's a main going down Newman Road. The sanitary line is going to tie into an existing sanitary line. It, it's, you can sort of see it right, right in the middle of the page where it says zoning line there. There's a sanitary line that we're tapping into and we have requested capacity at this point. The stormwater um, uh, is always a concern, understandably. Uh, we will work through with engineers. We'll control all stormwater and manage it on site to ensure post-construction runoff is equal or less than three construction rates. So we're going to do that by using the existing pond location as detention. And what that does is we are adding surface, we are adding roads and houses, 
But what that does is it allows us to collect the water, control the runoff, slow it down with our structures, so it maintains the same rate of runoff as pre-construction, so it doesn't impact. We're not allowed to impact anyone off the site, and um, we're going to adhere to that. Next slide. Um, the two lots to the south, um, again, there's going to be a, one new lot off of Highview Drive, and then the existing house on Highview is going to be split off. Currently, it's on a, a lot that's sort of non-conforming because it doesn't match, doesn't meet up with Highview Drive, but we're going to add a flag to that, and it's going to be broken out into an approximately 8.8 .8 acre lot with that flag on Highview. It's going to maintain, it's not going to be affected or impacted at all. So uh, this is just an idea of some of the architecture that we're proposing on the site. So the square footage has ranged from approximately 2,270 square feet to about 3,900 square feet, just on that typical lot size. Um, ultimately, you know, we sell uh, homes that allow for a lot of customization. So a lot of it's uh, up to the customer buying the home, what sort of finishes they want to use, what sort of model they want. Um, but we expect the housing prices to range anywhere from about $700,000, $800,000. Uh, a lot of times that depends on the custom customization that the customer's doing. One of the important uh, focal points in Fort Thomas, and understandably so, is the tree impact. Uh, with this site, it's about 27.15 acres, and there's about 15 acres of trees on the site. So we are. We are estimating that we're going to remove approximately 4.5 acres, and there's going to be about 10.5 acres remaining. Again, these are all based on preliminary engineering. So as we move forward and get into more finer detail, we can kind of nail this down and set our set our clearing limits a little tighter. So uh, one of the uh, one of the big steps with the tree with the trees is to go in front of the tree board. And what their consideration is, is for new development per ordinance 98.2, new development has to retain 40% of aggregate diameter inches of native trees to be preserved. So they want to make, if you don't preserve that, then you have to mitigate it, plant new trees, pay into a fund. Uh, we don't think that's, that's not going to be an issue at all. We, based on acreage, we anticipate saving about 65 to 70% of the trees on this site. In addition to that, the development will provide street tree plan with a minimum of one tree per lot. We'll have landscaping along Newman Road and entry sort of landscaping to bring people in. So our next step uh, in order to do this, surveying 50 acres of trees is a pretty big task. And so it does take a little bit of time. So what we have, we have Davies Baby Resource Group lined up to do this work. So they're scheduled to start at the beginning of August and it'll take two or three weeks to turn around the full report and then we can meet with the true board and show them and that'll just uh, confirm that we're going to be saving that 65 to 70% of the trees on this development. So it should have the, uh, give the tree board confidence to uh, move forward and uh, approve the plan that we're going to do. So at the same time, we're going to get our engineers with the approval of this to uh, perform boundary and topo surveys so we can move forward with final design, fine tune some of those uh, some of those details like the storm detention, what sort of pond, um, what's accurate limits of disturbance, and sort of nail down some of those details. So um, we, uh, uh, I know the tree board got canceled last last month, so we're going to move forward and uh, meet with the tree board the next opportunity, and we might actually wait until this study is prepared. So. Um, in order to get in front of that. So what I'm requesting tonight, um, again, it is approval of the stage one drawing contingent upon tree commission approval. So uh, we are not, again, we're not asking for a rezoning. We are adhering to the zoning codes that are in place. Um, we try to be sensitive to the site. We try to be sensitive to the topo. We try to be sensitive to the tree. And uh, I really think we put out a good quality, responsible plan um, for you to look at, and again, it, it's, uh, it's it, it adheres to all the codes and regulations, and we, we plan on uh, moving forward with this, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Is this development for Thomas Schools, you know? Yes, it is. For Thomas property also. 
Yes. The, the detention pond in the back, uh, does that have to grow in size? Or is it so, approximately the same size? So detention ponds are always tough to uh, nail down with preliminary engineering. Um, it's going to be in that location. Whether it ends up being a wet pond or a dry detention basin, it's going to really depend on the stormwater calculations. To keep it wet, you have to have so much room above the surface water elevation in order to control the runoff. So a lot of times it's hard to maintain that that, that same uh, that water. So if we want it to stay the same size, whether it ends up being a dry pond is still to be determined or whether we have to dig it out or adjust the water level it is really a question that is more of a final engineering um, scope that we really won't get into until final design stage two plans. Is that going to be a, is that going to be a stormwater quality pond as well? Yes. I'm sorry, what was the question? If that's going to be a stormwater quality pond as well. Yeah, so it will be a stormwater quality pond, and, and just so everyone's understanding, you have to control the runoff so it doesn't build up silt, and so build up silt or anything else that comes off of when you have new development. So what that pond does is it controls that, and again, it not only controls the rate of runoff, but it controls the quality of water to make sure that the waters of the same quality run off the site as it was pre-construction. The, uh, the house up there off of me, is that occupied? It, it, it's rented right now. Um, again, it's, we understand it's, it's a non-conforming lot right now, and it, it really is isolated from the site. Um, you know, the alternative is it just gets demolished, quite frankly, and it, it's, it's a good house, and we would like to find a way to keep that house and um, maintain it. Um, Again, there's several non-conforming lots here because the name didn't get extended up into there and there's not a right away the right there chasing those few lots up there. But but you did a separate permit to keep your FCA. There is there is a, yeah, we did we did check the title. Sure. He asked if there was a ingress egress easement to that property and we did do the title work and essentially what the title work says is there's a permanent ingress egress easement using the 10 foot driveway that's in place and it's used by them, it's used by the lot just to the east of it, the lot just to the north of it. What's the grade on the street? The grade on the street, um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, I know it adheres to the uh, subdivision regulations, so I would assume that it's Certainly under like eight percent of streets. Less than twelve. Yeah. Okay. Sidewalks so planned on both sides and one side? Uh both sides. So I seen the report, Frank, that uh, R one B you could potentially fit if it was possible to develop with this, you know, with the hillsides and stuff. Fifty nine homes and then 56 homes in the r one So you're, was it your finding that you could, if it was possible and we didn't have to worry about those sites, that it could have been over 100 homes on this site? The, the HOA. Right. 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 
property on the high view we have adequate lines on that call set? It, um, I'd have to look, if, if it doesn't, I mean, by creating the flags, I, I think we can, we, we, we can make it have 85 feet with a flag, uh, but I think it has 85 feet set back where it is now. So, so when the, when the final uh, plans come through, that would be a final review and determination to confirm that both of those lots have 25 foot of front. And, and essentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, at the setback, that would have to have the 85 foot width. So that's that's where you get the 85 foot width. And the standard lots that are over on uh, off of Newman, those are all 85 foot rectangles. When you get into a cul-de-sac lot, obviously you're not gonna have 85 foot at the street. So you have to have 85 foot at the setback line of the building, where the actual building is. So that's why it tapers out, ties out, and you have to have the 85 foot at that point and only 25 foot at the street. It'll definitely have 25 feet at the street. I'm not misconstrued your question there. It'll definitely have the 25 feet at the street and then it'll have 85 feet at a setback, whether that's a flat lot or not. I just drove down and I wasn't sure that there was adequate footage on the cul-de-sac to get what you're proposing for the existing house back there yeah. and the new lot in there. Yeah. There is. And, uh, like I said, we're actually bringing that lot into conformance because right now it doesn't actually have frontage on there because it's in different places. I guess Tim, just I had a question just in terms of the flatting. So for the, the lots on high view, would that technically be a separate subdivision or would that be part of the same subdivision as the new street? We talked about that a little bit and, um, you know, internally, and I think there is the opportunity that they could do that separately. Um, it's part of this proposed plan, but uh, technically, since it is two lots and it's a reconfiguration of a the lot, they, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a part of this entire plan. So, but this, and I'm going to go back to lot 25, and even though there is an access easement getting to it, the subdivision regs do not allow for the creation of a new lot, and this is a creation of a new lot because the lot lines are changing, uh, to not have access on a public right away. I presume there's not, at the extension of Maine, there's not an unapproved portion of Maine that technically right away would not be. There is. So there is an unapproved portion of Maine? Yes. So does that, so will the lot 25 front on the unapproved portion of Maine? As it stands, no. As, the, as it showed, no. Okay. Where is lot 25? Is that the large lot there? The, the easiest not, thing to correct that for the applicant would be to keep the lot as it is uh, down there. Um, if I'm if I'm not correct, it would be to essentially keep the lot line as it is. It's currently non-conforming, and to potentially leave it as it is and not change those lot lines. So that I understand that parcel is uh, consists of 11, 12, and 13. So. Uh, 8.6 acres. It's, uh, it's, oh, it's, yeah. right. So I guess if, I guess my question is that any opportunity, whether it be going through the Board of Adjustments or um, to get a flag to it to bring it into conformance. But I guess I guess if, if there a path to do that. Uh, through the city of Fort Thomas, or is it, uh, you can't do it? Oh, yeah. it, it, it's, it? There is not a variance process that you can go through to avoid okay. that in the summer. Okay. So all that property to the east of that lot is privately owned right now? It is. It's quite slight. It's privately, that property to the east and to the north is privately owned. The 
So I guess really the only way to get access to it would have to be to purchase it. Exactly. And that didn't work right. So I guess I guess what I guess what, what I'm hearing is there's no way to keep that house the way it is without taking a road down close enough to get a flat lot to it, which is impractical. And so there's just no way to keep that house in that without without lot of students to just want that. The lot is the lot is it showed right now is probably an acre, maybe that's just my guess. I don't know what it is exactly. Uh, the way it exists now, if you go back to the area you can see what it what that lot actually consists of. Um, it's kind of outlined in the white. That's what that light that line is. So it's it's impractical, I guess, for us to try to bring a road down the hill to that lot. So I guess that's that's where I was trying to see if there was some sort of way to just not quite oh, yeah. like, knock them in the house and keep it. Five oh nine main avenue on the PBA side here at the ten plus one seven eight. On the ten oh nine PBA side. There there's often times uh, discrepancies between the PBA, GIS, and then a final field survey parcel. Uh, from one acre. Oh, no, I think he was proposing that it would be one acre. Sorry. He's listing that currently as 8.6 acres. Well, it's split across the zoning. <coughs> oh, yeah, there's another 1.5 there. It's split across the I'm sorry, I can't hear. So the 10 acres that's in the PBA website. Yes. So eight and a half acres of it is a one zoning classification, and the other acre and a half is in a different zoning classification. When I look at the zoning map, which I was provided by the county, it all appears to be the R1D. Well, okay, one acre of that, the southern portion of that, of the lot 25 that we're talking about, I, is part of the big house that's at the end of Highview. So it's, it's not part of that house, but it's part of the same zoning. So the question really is, we don't, we as the planning commission do not want to create a new lot that doesn't meet our regulations because there's no way to get out to a public street on main, essentially the problem for that one portion. That doesn't affect the rest of the lots, it's just that one lot. So that, that's the question. Okay, we can't, we can't, we can't, it's like a one-sided conversation, so. The public will have their opportunity to come up and speak. Okay, well, we're it's just we can't hear you with a new microphone and it's not being recorded, so we want to make sure everybody has a chance. Okay, okay. we can't hear you guys. We can't hear you guys. I think we can get up there, we're, we might come back up. Okay. And you can sit down for a minute. Sure. Yes. <laughs> we're going to ask uh, the public, whoever raise your hands, please, who wants to be first, come forward to the microphone, identify yourself, your place of residence, Speak loudly so it's recorded, and we'll go from there. Yes, back here. Now, Ben, if you can't hear me, you just say so. But I haven't heard anything they've said almost. So I'm liable to ask the things that have already been asked and perhaps answered. Uh, my name is Steve Myers. I live on Highview Drive. Uh, and I have a few questions. Number one, it says this is stage one. That indicates to me that there's a stage two, three, four, I don't know, what? You say that you're going to have a single home for sale on uh, uh, 184 Highview. Do you intend to sell that with its surrounding 10 acres? If you put another flag lot right up there, a lot, not a flag lot, right up there near the end, I was always under the impression that Mrs. Jacobs only owned about 30 feet of road frontage there, even though she, her house sat on 10 acres. Uh, I know when it comes time for road repair assessments that she never got slammed like a lot of us did. So now if you cut that off, you're saying they have to have 25 feet 
and I don't know that there's even 50 feet there. But if there is, and you get that one, that leaves still only half of this plat is or the 27 acres looks like it's going to be developed under stage one, which makes me question stage two. You're going to try to put another 25 or 30 houses at the end of Highview Drive, and I'm wondering how you're going to do that when you don't have any area to do that. And, well, there's my question. <laughs> you want, you want me to come up and answer? Stage two is a refinement of stage one. It's, it's okay. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me make myself clear then. Is the existing lot or the existing house at 184 high view and the surrounding area that looks like it's about half of that point, the, the total of 27 acres, that looks like one chunk minus the little chunk up in the front corner there where you're going to put another house. Is that how you intend to sell that? Is one house on its 10 acres of ground? Sure. And no more houses off the end of high view. That's right. I'll come up here, Mike. Uh, so there is there is enough frontage at the right of way for the two lots that are there. Again, this is stage one, meaning there's this this is the and only phase. Stage one is the city's term for the first step in the process to get this approved. Um, this is the plan. It's not changing. Okay, but you said somebody said something about 56 homes or whatever. They said where's the other 25 going to go? Uh, they said per the zoning code. Uh, if you were again, it's not a, the zoning code dictates that you can put lots. You can only you can put lots up to it has to be 13,000 square feet, and so you, that's how many lots you could fit on with that size lot. Okay. We're not doing that. We're putting these lots in, and this is all that we're putting in. This is the one and only phase that we're developing. Okay. So that 184 is going to remain there and, and yes. the surrounding acreage that's that, going to be for sale. Yeah, that, that lot right there is about 8.8 .8 acres and the existing home is going to remain as is and be sold as is. On that amount of land? On that, on that 8, 8, 8, yeah, yes. roughly 8.8 okay. 8 .8 acres. We'll, we'll find you, but it's about yeah, 8. I, I, that, that, well, yeah, I just, I just was wondering how you're going to get another 50 out of 30 yeah. houses. Yeah. There's yeah. absolutely not no, going to be. We have no egress off of Newman with the flag lots there, and that only left high view drive. Yeah. And, and I understand there's a lot of, yeah. I would be very clear, this is the plan. Okay. No more mm -hmm. lots, no more yes. houses. Okay. The stage, the in, for a little bit of clarity, the stage two references the, the developer providing us with more detail. Engineering detail, um, uh, associated with storm drainage, things of that nature. There's a lot more pro to provide at a later date. But as far as changing any plan, okay. that's, it's not being that's modified. A, that, was, that was quite sort of an answer to the question. You may have done uh, uh, storm surge studies and, and stuff. Your engineers are going to look at that before this goes on. Absolutely. Okay, cool. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my question, okay, my question is, I'm Ken Bowman from Altamont Court, 60 Altamont. My question is, the remaining green space that is uh, not part of the immediate development, is there any chance that there could be some dialogue with the Conservancy to preserve the existing that is not necessary for the lots? Uh, to, just to relieve everybody's fears of, of loss of green space, could there be a potential partnership with the Conservancy to dedicate that as protected? It, it, it's not a requirement as part of the subdivision regs, but I mean that's a very good question for the applicant. Um, you know, I think you know as part of the development, we need to, as far as the development, we're going to uh, cre create a tree preservation plan. And we have to stick to that tree preservation plan uh, through the phases. Um, once we get past that, uh, you know, we're sort of selling the lots on, and it's going to be owned by other people. Uh, you know, I, I can certainly, I don't know the details of setting up a conservancy. I mean, ultimately, it's not going to be owned by trees. It's not, it's going to be owned by the individual private owners. Um, and so I, we can look into it, but I'm not sure about the details of it. I mean, we don't, I think Fort Thomas, doesn't allow trees to just be cut down 
at will on these on these type of sites. So uh, we're required to keep a certain amount, and uh, you know through our development, we'll keep all the trees that we're showing that we're keeping. And I'll, I will look into the conservancy and see if they're seeing what the ins and outs of doing that is, and, and how to set something like that up. I'm just not. We okay, it with it right it on the exists now and it protects a lot of the power park woods, okay. for instance, and a few other areas in town. I think Mr. Wormo can speak to that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, ultimately, well, it benefits, the trees benefit us as much as they benefit anyone selling the house. That's what I'm thinking, too, yeah. for the potential sale of the property, sure. those owners knew that the green space is going to remain green space and it's protected into perpetuity. That would be appealing to a potential, you know, somebody who's buying a square lot. There's all this green space behind it that's part of the sure. same property acquired. They would like to note it that the trees are going to stay. I understand. Okay. Sir, and if you want to get with us something we can talk about, if it's done while trees is the title owner of that property, then I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, I'm not sure. The bottom line is what I'm saying is at some point, Conservancy agreement came about while Trees was the title owner. It would run with the land to anyone who sold it. So, okay. And that has been pretty common with some recent, more recent developments that either the Conservancy is uh, potentially a part of that and or a green space preservation easement is, is uh, created uh, in those areas. Okay. And we're certainly open to that. I live at Highview Drive. I have three questions. The first one is, is the planning uh, commission planning on factoring in anything at the track or at the stop sign at the end of Newman and Churchill? Um, I don't know if any of you have spent time at that intersection, but that stop sign is frequently ran. Um, there's a lot of pedestrians, a lot of children that use that as an access point to cross the street. So from a safety perspective, I'm very concerned about not installing a traffic light, a crosswalk, or other appropriate safety measures. Has that been thought about in our plan? And if not, it should be. Well, it's gonna take one kit. So I don't know if the Trees Corporation, somebody needs to think about making the that The developer wouldn't be responsible for that. I understand we have to take more turkey. But it would be state, the city and state. It would be a city. Those are all city streets there. If that's something that um, would need, need to be considered. Based on my inclination is that based on the volume of traffic that this is going to generate, it did not warrant a traffic study of any kind. That, that's correct. Okay, that's good. Um, next question. I'm assuming these schools will need to Ruth Moyer Elementary. Has any conversations happened with the school board to ensure that, that school can absorb potentially 50 additional children? It already has the largest class size of any elementary school in our district. So, the, the answer is no, it has not been reviewed okay, with good. the school. So we're really keeping the children in the forefront as we all profit off this transaction. Third question. What is the total acreage size that the Drees Corporation purchased from any private seller involved in this transaction? I see 27 acres accounted for. Is that the total purchase acreage that was purchased or was it closer to the neighborhood of 44 to 47 acres? Yeah, it's 27.1. Was your total purchase? Yeah, okay. we're under contract for it. We have to purchase it. Okay. We're under contract. Okay, thank you. That's all my question. I was just going to clarify one thing about the traffic study that you asked about. So the city can conduct a study in generalities, but I think what, what Kevin was referring to, the state has specific criteria about meeting the need for it. That's called a warrant for a traffic signal. You have to have so much volume of traffic for the traffic signal. And the amount of traffic that's on Newman today and the amount that might come from lots here isn't enough volume to meet the state's criteria yeah totally understand i just think whether it meets criteria or not it still poses a risk to the pedestrian children that use that intersection every day i've already almost seen 
multiple individuals hit by cars because they're running the stop sign. So if you add 24 additional homes, 25 additional homes at four occupants per home, half of them drive, that's adding a lot of traffic into an already overtaxed intersection. So as a parent of a young child in the community, I'm very concerned about the impact of that street as well as Newman, how quickly people drive up and down the street. This is only gonna make that worse because it's gonna be a cut through. So those are my concerns and those are my questions. Thank you for listening. I think that one thing that we can do from a policing standpoint is certainly, you know, at the time when houses are sold, we can certainly increase policing. We can certainly improve signage if necessary. Those are certain, certainly things that we can do as a city. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Yes? Yes. yes. My name is Linda Eads. I reside at 1759 Wedgwood Lake Drive. I've lived in Fort Thomas for over 20 years. I'd like to address the following concerns. Fort Thomas is an aging suburban city that should begin to address housing needs more creatively in an area where many studies are seeing the need to get rid of single family zoning and develop strategies for what makes of affordable housing. Fort Thomas should do likewise. The property is a relatively large open space that provides habitat for wild turkeys, hawks, deer, and other animals that are enjoyed by our neighbors. It makes for enjoyable walking for young and old alike. I request the developer consider retain, retaining as much tree canopy as possible for the wildlife, uh, which it sounds like they make an effort to do so. I commend that. Since the opening of Newport Pavilion, Newman Avenue has experienced an increase in traffic with a speeding and continuing problem, which was mentioned by the prior speaker. Pedestrians must take care to cross the street, and I'm talking about Newman at this point, um, not just the intersection the lady mentioned. Especially during commuting hours, there's a sidewalk on one side of the street only with a mountable curb. I would request the developer and the city consider more traffic calming measures as have been used on Chesapeake, which appear to be helping to slow traffic. The distance between the Gettysburg driveway, I'm not sure about the measurements because I couldn't really tell, um, and maybe the gentleman can address this, but it, it appears that the distance between the Gettysburg driveway and the proposed new street is approximately like 100 feet. Um, would it not be possible to consider a realignment and use of a, perhaps a roundabout? If not, the city should install some means of slowing traffic like as a stretch of human is on a curb with a very limited sideline. Thank you. Um, really quickly, I, I think just to address one of those items, uh, I think the applicant at one point did consider an alignment. I, I don't know if you came away from that or what, what your thoughts were on that alignment. So, so what we've done so far is the alignment as far as where the road is. Um, in relation to Gettysburg. In, in relation to Gettysburg, uh, we, we studied site distance, and ultimately with a community this size, our main concern is site distance. Can you pull in and out of the community with the uh, safely? And there's rules and regulations that sort of dictate that. And we've studied the site distance, and there is appropriate site distance in both directions. So with that being said, you know, realigning that road, um, you know, with it's just it's not feasible keeping the same sort of plant that we have and it's unnecessary because we need the appropriate scientists. In, in addition to that, um, in regards to any traffic, speeding, things of that nature, that's certainly something that obviously we've taken, uh, the city's taken some measures down on Chesapeake. Uh, you know, if, if it warrants, you know, this is our responsibility. It wouldn't be the, the developer's responsibility to control traffic. Um, that those are certain things, certainly things that we can consider um, if, if necessary when 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 the development comes through. That being said, we can, um, uh, like as I said before, certainly um, take a look at that intersection, improve improve policing and things of that nature. But you know, to put that notice on the developer is not something that uh, they would be responsible for. My name is Jim Sider. 
Okay, I guess you want to speak. Yeah, right up in it. Uh, along that line, I don't know how many times I've, I've come down here and come to a complete stop, heading northbound, turn signal on the turn left on the Churchill, and car just look right through there and almost hit it. And I'm just wondering if uh, a flashing stop sign like the have on Fort Thomas, South Fort Thomas Avenue, just right up here. Maybe a flashing stop sign might be appropriate there. I mean, those are all things that we can consider. You know, I don't want to say yay or nay. I don't know the electric abilities there. Um, the, the, the solar, those are, I, I believe, solar operated. So there's a lot of factors that, that I can't just say automatically. But, you know, those are certainly things, um, you know, that we could consider. And I know a lot of people don't like the idea of prairie cameras. But could that camera be installed? Fort Thomas Street, is that, that really is a bad intersection for people running. Well, so we do have speed, um, not necessarily cameras, but down Chesapeake we have the speed, uh, right, I've seen that. the speed, catcher, I'm not sure what you call that, speed, uh, 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 yeah, it tells the number, that the, the speed you are going. As far as cameras, that's a whole other issue. That would be a council issue and, yeah, a, and, a, yeah. and a whole other discussion. discussion. There are a lot of people who don't like or stop signs. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? No. Right up there. My name is Jennifer Davidson. I live on Highland Avenue, and my meadow is on Highview Avenue. I'm curious to hear from the builder their estimation, if approved, from start to finish, on when and how long it's going to take the full development to be built and um, and sort of the sold out, I guess, if you will. And then the other question is, where is the primarily the, the construction traffic going to occur? <coughs> what road? Sure. Um, if this were to proceed, we would anticipate probably starting to develop next spring, uh, just based on the timelines and the time for approvals, uh, meaning the actual new road would be paid um, later on in the fall, sort of that fall winter time. And construction of houses, you know, we'll probably sell 12 to 18 houses a year. Um, you guys live in Fort Thomas, you know how sought after living in Fort Thomas, it may be faster here. Um, so, you know, it, I would expect two, three years for full build out. Uh, construction traffic. Um, as far as the development goes, construction traffic is fairly measured. They pull onto the site with their equipment, and then they, and then they leave. So everything would be coming from Newman, um, whether it's coming from north or south. I honestly am not sure, and uh, I'd have to kind of get into those details a little more. But it, it would mostly be all Newman. Of course, the one on High View. Uh, you know, while they're building that house, there would be the construction traffic coming back through there. Hello, Doug Roll, Six Lilac. Uh, I had a couple questions relative to the roads. Uh, again, and this goes to the last question, but is there any provisions for bonding the roadways that they're actually going to use to get on to this into this development? And I say that because the residents are all assessed for the roadways, and, and of course, I live on a corner. I got hit for a Lilac and Newman, um, year about two or three years apart. So that's one of my questions. Um, also, with the work that is in, and I guess it's uncertain what's going to take place down off of Main Avenue, um, I'm actually here twofold. I work for the city of Newport as well. So I guess my concern would be, is there going to be construction traffic uh, down near Main Street, coming off of Main Street, down in there? And if so, of course, Waterworks Road was recently um, paid and, and uh, improved and Main Street is not a road that is in um, adequate for any kind of construction traffic um, it, even being 10 foot wide I guess at the end and things of this nature plus the fact that London Acres Drive which is 
which has a bridge across it. We surely don't want any traffic coming across that. That has a six ton limit. So those are some of my concerns. Um, beyond that, I think coming out onto Newman Street the way it is drawn, I actually think is a good plan keeping traffic out of, of a lot of the existing neighborhoods. Um, as far as the, uh, the one lot down there, Jacobs, I really don't have a comment on it per se. I know there'll be some construction traffic relative to building that lot out. And I don't, I don't foresee any large trucks damaging uh, high view, but I would be concerned that if the roads aren't bonded or there isn't some kind of uh, requirement that uh, so these roads can be restored to the condition that existed prior to, because currently there are stormwater issues on uh, Newman uh, um, to where the road is deteriorating and it's deteriorating rapidly. I brought this up to uh, the previous city administrator along with um, the engineer that was involved on uh, Lilac Lane when they did it. Um, so my concern is that, that these things be addressed not as an afterthought but as a preemptive thought. Uh, additionally, I guess there's been some comments relative to um, the corner of Newman and Churchill. And I don't know if Churchill still has a load capacity on it. It used to be where there was no truck traffic permitted on it. It's, it was replaced in a concrete street a couple years ago. So I don't know if that's still a restriction on there. I, to be honest, I don't, I don't pay attention to it. But as far as the stop, say, uh, stop signs and all that stuff at the corner of Newman, and, and I'm just going to go over this. It has no bearing on this development, but I'm going to go over it nonetheless. The, uh, as far as the stop sign uh, for Newman and uh, Churchill is, I think it needs to be better marked. Vegetation that's blocking or impeding any of the traffic signals needs to be cleared. And when I say better marked, I think stop bars would be in, would be in order. I don't think flashing stop signs are appropriate for a neighborhood, um, especially one that's residential such as this. I think in commercial areas, I, I really don't see a problem with it. But in, in a setting like this, I don't think it's appropriate. Um, and then with regard to a roundabout or something like that, I think it's the worst idea ever. Um, it, it, it's, it's, we're not trying to encourage people to continue to go around and around and not stop. We're trying to encourage them to stop. You want to control the speed of which traffic flows through. Not to mention that you don't have the, you don't have the land to do it anyway. So I guess that's my, my thoughts on the matter. And I don't know if we can get an answer relative to bonding of streets would be the most critical thing I think that I'm going to. So typically, bonding of streets occurs as part of the next phase where we review the cal plan. Is that going to be a requirement? I don't know if it'll be a requirement at this time. I mean, it's a I've quick asked that it would be a requirement. And then I also asked that they have a defined plan of how they're going to access this site, this come in with construction traffic. Because as you well know, they, they put some, uh, you call it, uh, uh, you know, barriers to slow traffic, uh, road calming. You call it road calming, yeah. I call it obstruction. In, in Chesapeake. And quite honestly, I drive a full-size Ram truck and it's tight. I don't know how you're servicing um, uh, ambulance or fire truck down through this down through this this area appropriately. And I don't even know if it meets uh, proper code, MUTCD code, relative to the width that is left once that median went through the middle of it. So those would be my concern as well. Are you going to bring traffic up through, uh, up down Newman to the development from uh, Highland Avenue? You know, those things I'd like to know because I think all that comes into play. Is there going to be dirt hauled out of this site? Is there going to be dirt brought into the site? How are you going to do it? I think all these things need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. My questions and concerns dovetail 
with those of the gentleman who just spoke. Sorry. I don't know if any of you remember the development of Bella Grande. It was 2010. I think it was Fisher Homes. I don't want to step on toes. Yes. But I happen to live in condominiums, third floor unit, bird's eye view of that hillside. It was completely denuded. And I understand trees have to come down for development to take place. My concern was, at first, that hillside turned into a logging camp. And I worked for a company that made paper. I've been to logging camps. There were huge trucks coming down the hill with massive trees. So this gentleman talked to from trees, talked about bringing in construction materials. My concern is, and I don't know the size of the trees that are on the affected property, but if they're large, you need massive vehicles. And when apparently Fisher got behind on Villa Grande, they brought in industrial generators and industrial wood chippers, and the city of Fort Thomas gave them permission to run those things 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Those of us at Eagle View, Eagle View got very little sleep. And I'm not talking about a few days or a few weeks. It went on and on and on. So living at 62 Daisy Lane, I will not be as directly impacted by the noise. But there's going to be a lot of noise. So thank you for listening to my concerns. My wife and I live at 529 Main Avenue, which is right by 509. And uh, I have several uh, things I'd like to bring up. One of them is the runoff from that site will primarily run off onto my property. Uh, and when I say my property, I have a bridge that goes over Taylor Creek. Uh, and I have a swale that comes down alongside my property, which currently is one of the main watersheds of that entire area. And we regularly have flooding uh, when we have a hard rain. And anybody that uh, works in the city road department will be able to tell you that they have to come down all the time onto my property and clear out the culverts because there are two uh, 36 to 40 inch culverts uh, which make up the, uh, the bridge. Uh, and there's always debris and everything that clogs that up. Number one, I think that, that if they want, if they're going to create, I understand the retention pond, I understand how it works with the head wall, and it to some extent does control uh, the water runoff. But when you consider that what used to be all soft land is now going to be mostly hard, well, uh, you're going to have roofs, you're going to have the roadway, and during an extremely hard rain, we're going to get a lot of runoff on my property which I have a great concern for. Uh, and that swale currently, which floods, is going to be a lot worse than it is now. Uh, so I, that's a, a, certainly something I would like to see for us. Um, and we currently have a lot of water problems just to, uh, from being on that hillside. We've spent $14,000 already having our basin waterproof, and they've come back, I think they're on the eighth time, because there's so much uh, groundwater in that area that it's hard to keep it down. Not only is there groundwater from runoff, but there is a, there are a lot of underground, uh, there's a lot of streams, or I guess I want to call them un underground springs. Uh, springs, yes, thank you. Uh, and whenever you disturb one over here, you all of a sudden have water in another area. It's, it doesn't just impact that area. It's, uh, we have a lot of shale in, in this area, anybody, I'm sure most of you guys understand that. With the clay and the shale, 
whenever you disturb that, you really change the way that water runs off. So I would like assurances that I am not going to have issues with that, and I would like some uh, legal assurances of that. If that's, if, uh, if that's not, I would hope that's possible. I would think out that's possible. Because you can understand my plight. Right now, I already have a lot of water issues, and uh, it's going to increase. I understand the retention line is still going to increase. And as far as the lot, I thought we need to lot 25, which is 509 Main Avenue. Is that correct? Uh, the house that you said is down there and only has 10 feet of road frontage? Is that correct? Yeah. That road frontage is my property. My property extends across the roadway. The city has a right of, uh, there's a utility right of way through my property on that street. As a matter of fact, when the sewer department comes back and does work, they damage the road, they have to repair it. Uh, and I'm sure that it, being that we're going to have all sorts of new water issues, my road is not going to hold up very well just because of the water underneath it from disturbing all the way. I don't have a problem with development, but I, I want to see responsible development. I think most people probably feel the same way as I do. Uh, so that's something that really needs to be looked into. As I understand from talking to somebody, I don't know if it was you, Kevin. Uh, I talked to somebody on the phone, I don't remember the name. Okay. Well, I also talked to somebody on the city. And I was uh, told that there was no geological survey or any kind of uh, uh, study of what the, 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 the geology of the, the stone and the, the clay, et cetera, et cetera, uh, other than a typical land survey that was done. Usually that comes into play when you're getting into the hillsides, which they have not done significantly. Um, there are significant geological requirements that they start moving hillsides and things of that nature. So under the circumstances, and correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, it, my inclination is there wouldn't be a geological survey needed for what they disturbed up to this, what they're proposing to this Can I, can I go to Sure. Uh, just out of doing our due diligence, we'll do geological test warrants on the site in order to ensure that, you know, the soil is proper and the structure is proper for our houses. We leave ourselves a ton of liability if we don't do that. I understand that. So, you so yes, you're concerned about your houses that you own um, and you are selling, but what about the surrounding property? Sure. What kind of assurances do we have? So, so right now, the water's coming off all uncontrolled into that pond, which really doesn't hold any water. It just throws the water out as soon as it comes down. So again. Part of our design, we'll do the calculations, stormwater calculations. They're reviewed and approved by the city. And what those stormwater calculations will do is they will ensure that the impact in the water is not coming at a greater rate than it is. So it's, if anything, it's going to be better than it currently is. And we're not allowed, by code, by law, we're not allowed to do that and to impact the negative. What kind of legal assurances it's, uh, it's through the approval of the of the, the drawings. I would assume that Villa Grande. Sorry, I'm shouting. I understand. Uh, I would assume that Villa Grande also had essentially the same responsibilities, and there are there's still a lot more water on Waterworks Road. I drive Waterworks Road every day, and they've done all sorts of remediation uh, because they didn't plan that out correctly. So, uh, you know, how many years has that been? 2010s to 12 years, there are still issues that are unresolved. Again, I can't speak for Villa Grande. We rely on our engineers to put together the stormwater calculations and the stormwater plan to ensure that it meets everything. And again, I, I keep going back. We are meeting all the regulations that we need to meet to do this. And that's really, and the city approves our designs. They approve our stormwater calculations. They approve our structures that we're putting in to ensure all that is appropriately designed and controlled properly. The, 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 the issue I'm sure a lot of us have that with any kind of uh, development is that uh, someone like Trees or whoever would develop maybe some of these outlying properties uh, has a lot more money to pay attorney's fees than we do. So when there's an issue, we don't have, uh, I mean, yes, we have some rights, but uh, the, your rights go as far as 
your attorneys will take it. And we don't have twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars for attorney fees. And you know, what typically happens is you go to court, they give you the, you know, you, the developer or whatever asks for continuance. Well, you just pay your attorney. You go again, you pay your attorney, and that's that's something that uh, I think any of us that are in this area would like to have some assurance, legal assurance, that we will be made whole. So, can I suggest, I mean, and I don't know if anybody can hear me, but maybe the best thing, as these calculations come in, Frank will be reviewing them, we can make sure they're public record, we can make sure they're available to you, you can take them to an expert yourself, but we'll make sure that, that you're, you're kept in the loop along the way. I don't have the money to pay an expert, and most of us don't. I know the Greeks has money, the city has their own people, we don't have that. But most of us do not have an extra $20,000 or even $10,000 or $3,000 to pay for somebody to review the plans. That's why the city's going to review them, but I just wanted to let, give you that opportunity. So we Thank still you. don't have any assurance that we won't be dragged out for 12, 15 years to like the people for Bill Grande currently. One other thing I want to point out. so. So the detention basin is going to be used. Before the pond is out there now, that they're going to turn into the detention basin. The yeah. same, these people can't hear you. So, okay, just your microphone. There's a pond in the back of the property that'll be used for stormwater detention. So what that means is, all the stormwater runoff from the houses and from the street will flow into that pond. They will excavate out that pond to make sure it has enough volume to hold all the runwater runoff for a 100 year storm. The sanitation district will require the homeowners association to enter into a permanent agreement with the sanitation district to maintain that stormwater detention forever. The sanitation district is the one that will enforce that on the property owners on the street. That's one reason why I asked that question earlier, the house on Highview and the other house back on Main would be part of that because it's really not fair to them since their drainage isn't going to. But in any case, the sanitation district is really the enforcer of that yes. stormwater runoff. Not really even the city, it's the sanitation district. And ultimately, Driesel, once they sell this property, Dries is kind of out of the picture. That's correct. It'll then be the homeowners association. Um, the other thing I guess I would ask you is, if you're having those issues now with this well and with Taylor Creek, have you contacted the sanitation district to bring up those issues to them? They, uh, they've been back there, as a matter of fact. They, uh, rebuilt my bridge one time because uh, the owner of the, that property, property currently, his mother thought that she owned that bridge. And she called the sanitation department and said that their truck had damaged the bridge, but it was an oil truck. And I was getting bids currently at that time to have it repaired. Came down the street one day after work and they were rebuilding the bridge because they thought it was their responsibility. Once they found out that it wasn't their responsibility, they said, well, I guess we have to finish it now that we've already torn it up. So I got a, a you know, a $28,000 bridge out of deal, but still it's not sufficient for the, you know, to bring this up again, it's not sufficient for increased water, which uh, I understand potential. I work for an architect. I understand the detention retention ponds, and I still know that there are always a lot of associated differences due to the shale, et cetera, and ground. So that's something that I think uh, other people that live in the area would like, me, because I'm sure that there's gonna be some issues around Newman or some of the other. Is that going to be, uh, is that road going to be ground, on the ground or a ridge, or is it going to be, uh, is it going to be uh, at the bottom? It will be, so the road will be higher than the rest of the area. I don't think that that's so, so the road will not be inverted like that. The the road road will be I'm ground. talking the land on which the road sits. So all roads are ground, actually. But it's not actually. Uh, it looks like the ground surrounding it will be at the same elevation through the hopes and then it will start to fall back. Which means that there will be there will be runoff that's. Uh, not no, I, I think, and again, we haven't seen a drainage report, but my assumption is that the driveways will drain to the road and the downspots will be connected to the storm zone. All right. Is that? Yeah. Uh, you can't, you can't. There's a, there's a curb and gutter on the road, and we're, so from the houses, everything from 
the rear of the house is forward, drains into the road, and it gets all captured into the storm system, and then all goes through the stormwater uh, detention or retention basin. Right. So it's all controlled through that. Did you say that the size of the, the, the future retention basin will be approximately the same size as that pond is now? Uh, it, it'll be approximately, probably, yes, approximately the same size. It's only 8 feet deep. Understand, it may end up being a dry detention basin which allows food, which you can dig out and create more storage. That's my issue, is, is I'm trying to get to, is it won't be dry because of all the groundwater that already exists, because of all the streams. Okay, I guess, as a matter of fact, that swale is a stream so, in and of itself. So I, I, I don't mean to belabor the point, but I keep going back to it. It'll be designed appropriately and reviewed by the city, so it will, it will control the water on the site, and so, how that's done requires the stage two drawings and further design to get there. But again, we do it, we do the stormwater calculations, they approve it, and then it goes to the state, and the state approves our plans. Would, uh, just, just with the modification, like as Dave mentioned, it's actually sanitation district number one. Sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that sway on the bottom has a 10 inch pipe that runs it off the creek. I can't see where that's going to be sufficient because once the retention pond fills up, it comes out a pipe axis is a site that no matter the size of the pipe it's going to force water as much as possible so it's going to force down that swale and then it's going to flood the bottom of the road because it doesn't take much to clog up a typical pipe like that and pour it out many times itself so i hope that 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 they would enlarge that pipe with that knowledge sure so, uh, in that, uh, so we'll, we'll give some other people a chance to ask questions but i, I think what the point is we can't put more water into that pipe than it's already going into. So that pipe is going to, re I don't know where the pipe is, I don't know if it's on our property or the other property, but uh, from where I think it is, it's not going to be, it's not on our property and it's not gonna to be touched. And so we're controlling the water by going through the basin, having an outlet structure, and that outlet structure controls how the water gets released out there. So again, it's all uncontrolled right now, it's going to be better controlled in the future. Yep. Thanks for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Sir, could you uh, state your name for the record? We got your address. Daniel Snow, S N O W. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ryan Fryer. I live at 332 C Avenue. Uh, I have two questions to raise. Speak right in, right in, right in, right in, right in, right in, right So my two questions are, one, the, what plans, does, does the green on the map here show, does that imply new tree planting, or is that conservation of the existing uh, trees that are there? It's approximate conservation of the trees. So those are the trees that are there for the green. Okay, because out of my bedroom window now, I'll be looking at your development. Uh, it's probably not going to be excited for this now, uh, unfortunately, but I'm all for it. Anyways, the, the other issue that I have is that uh, there may be historic things of historical significance within that area, as I have found a uh, somewhat historical significant object on the property adjacent, on, uh, adjacent to your property. Uh, that I believe is a weapon from the Indian battle that took place in 1745 between the Cherokee and Shawnee. So I would behoove you to uh, have some sort of means of if any historical significance is discovered in the development process that you do your due diligence in some level of historical stuff. Thank you. Came up and said, 
is it not 44 to 46 acres? And I thought, would that, would that go out, out of nowhere, or is there another almost 20 acres that could be developed kind of in conjunction with this? It, it's not part of this proposal. This proposal is for what you see and the 27 acres. Uh, everything else appears to be privately owned. The city owns property adjacent. Um, everything else adjacent, this gentleman down in Maine noted he owns adjacent. There's no other property. Okay, the next one is I'm wondering if there is going to be a zone change. And the reason I ask that is because the more I get familiar with the zoning, R1D, or R1A, residential, single family, big lot. They go A, A, which are bigger. But B is a little bit smaller, C is a little bit smaller, D is a little bit smaller than that. Because these are one of one of the things is R1B, four of them are R1D, and maybe two B, if you know about the, the, the piece of property. Um, if the zoning stays R1D, theoretically, this plan could be great. They could say, you know what, we changed our mind, and somebody can come in and say, you know what, we are going to build that 120 houses down there. Because it is currently zoned to accept R1D, which is really scary to me, to think that there could be 100, not in this development, just, you know, the Greece representative clearly stated that's not his intention. But what would be a zone change to guarantee that? What I have experienced is if the door is open, and, and I think that it was the point which made to scare people to say, you know what, if you don't take this, you're going to get 100 houses down there which to me is intimidation, but that's the second point. If the door is open to allow for 100 houses, who will shut that door? So, uh, there is not a zone change on the table. Uh, the zone, Should there be? That would be up to the property owner to make that request. Well, and let me just say one other thing for all of you that are gathered here this evening is one of the, our next agenda item is to review all of our zoning classifications and update them. So moving forward, we're in the middle of that process right now, the planning commission as a whole, for the whole city. Um, so we're reviewing the zoning ordinance, how much density there is, what type of buildings there are, all of those rules that, that govern development in the city of Fort Thomas are in the middle of being reviewed right now. So if you have an interest in that, I encourage you to come to, the, come to our meetings over the next several months as we work through that process. So to some degree, I think your concerns may be addressed as part of that process. But in terms of this specific development by Greece, they're not asking for any changes from what's out there today. And so that's what we're moving forward with. And obviously, if these houses are built as they're proposed, it would be very difficult to come back in and retrofit it down the road. Wouldn't be hard to tear one down and put four in. Um, if it's an R1D. They, actually, the R1D, just so you know, is, is actually one of the more restrictive uh, zones. It's 13,000 square feet. Your R1C is like seven. Your R1B is 7,500. Your R1A is even um, 9,000 square feet, which is less than the 13. The, the planning commission. I thought it was like acreage of a lot. It is. It's, it's acreage of the the area, the, the entire area. So the R1D zone um, is actually one of the more restrictive. It's 13,000 plus square feet. The, the only other that is more restrictive is R1AA, which is an acre. Um, the Planning Commission at some point in the past had the foresight to see these large parcels and see this large parcel and put this as an R1D. So it couldn't be overdeveloped. So that's some of the things that the Planning Commission does that you don't maybe, maybe see, but this was put in an R1D at some point in the past to somewhat restrict what you could do with this with this parcel because it is one of the more restrictive lot sizes. 13,300 square feet is rather large lot in comparison to any other area in the city, other than one other zone, which are generally outskirt lots along the river. I, I looked, I, I spent a lot of time on Uh, same as the, the C, there was, and again, I, I randomly picked 
come on one single street, it was 0.215 acre, another one on that same street, 1.01 1 .01 acre. Those so, are in R1C. So they aren't required, when, when a development is, is done, they aren't required to put it right at that, that amount. In many cases, we have streets that are on a ridge top that go over ridges, and there are a number of houses that have several acre lots that to some extent can't be developed because it's all hillside, it goes back. So the fact that they have larger lots doesn't mean that they're in a different zone. They are still within that whatever zone they are in and, and they, they still have that restriction of 7,000 square feet, although they might have an acre or two acres or more. Um, in this particular zone, uh, once again, that is a, about a third of an acre. That they, they would, and that's what they're designing this to, to meet. One third acre per Thir Thirteen three. Thirteen thousand three hundred square feet. Okay. So next, the next question I get with, can we get a copy of, of this plan? When we were in the very beginning, when it was saying, and this one is, you know, this lot, lot this number is this many, this many feet by this many, and the next one is this, you're, you're like trying to write as quickly as you could, but it's not a realistic expectation that everyone has this visual in their head. Sure. I think it's not a realistic expectation that we go on and print this off on how many pages it is to study it. I think that it should be provided to the residents. I think it's it's not the first time it's come up. And you said come to the meetings. I don't know, Mr. Wormald, how many times you've seen me. More than once. Several, in fact. And I am trying to learn. I'm trying to stay involved. I'm trying to make sense of some of this. Um, but it's pulling teeth to get the information. And it, an awful lot of this was discussed prior, or else some of the comments from the board would not have come up the way that they did. You were very well informed, or not. So that's a concern. Is there a way that we can get a copy of this data? We, we can, this is public record, and we can put it on our website. I think that- Again, I can download it and print it, right? Yes, you can come up and request it. We can, we can have it for you at the office. You can request that of us. Okay, great, thank you. Because, um, you know, when they talk about a couple of the other plans, like 160 pages, and on page seven, it'll say we refer back to 0 0.113 A, and it's like, gosh, there's that, and you're looking through on the website. It's not feasible, it's not realistic. I think it's unfair, I think it's unrealistic. So, if we could get a copy, that would be great. Um, another thing, and this is this is an emotional thing for me in the beginning of the presentation, they mentioned that they took into account the yard and the tree, and the green space. Never once was a person mentioned. We didn't think of the neighbor. We didn't think of the children who may be here. We, we didn't make any consideration of anything but the physical building on a physical piece of land. And there's humans who are impacted by this. There's a, a lot of humans in, in a couple of ways. To the gentleman who just spoke, it's, it's you know, having an $800,000 home on your street doesn't make you a a wealthy person. It'll probably raise your taxes when they decide that gosh, these houses on this street are, are getting 800000 and they used to be getting much less. But it, it, it troubles me that we don't hear people. Just like in some of the other plans that I've seen, it talks about, well, back to the form based code, you don't see yards, you don't see trees, you don't see those things. That's a personal concern. Lastly, um, I've heard several times, by law, we don't have to do this. By law, we don't need to advertise up until so many hours before. By law, we don't have to have a public hearing at this time. By law, we don't, you know, we can do this. Isn't it time we do what's right and not just stay on the legal side of it? We always were kind of a community that stay involved, stay informed, love your neighbor, ask yourself, work together, and actually Malden met, it mentioned that much. Now it's like, well, legally we don't have to do conservation study. Legally we don't have to do a drainage study. Legally we don't. Well, it's nice to stay on the side of the law, but isn't it nice also to stay on the side of the people? That's my concern. It seems as if development is nece isn't necessarily progress. It isn't necessarily uh, strongly negative. But to say it's going to be developed doesn't mean it's going to be developed to enhance anybody, somebody's life, but not everybody involved. Um, I, I know that there's still a lot of 
things that did turn out as intended with the One Highland project, because doors were opened and stuff was decided, and then there was a public hearing, and I appreciate the public hearing prior to the vote, although it said, I think I heard that you were hoping to get a vote tonight. I think, I think public input is kind of on the, the bottom of the agenda, and I think it should be higher up. So first, I mean, and one more thing, if there's anybody else out there who speaks, I realize at one of the One Highland meetings, public meetings, right before the voted in, I call it One Highland, although it's probably had a different formal name. Somebody, one of the zoning people said, okay, last question, I'm done. I'm a volunteer, I don't get paid for this, it's getting too late, I want to go home. And the city attorney at that time, was Jan Seidenfeld, said, you can't, if there are more questions, you must stay to answer. So I don't know if anybody else is watching the clock, but if anyone behind me chooses to speak, now is your chance. They're giving us this chance. I think it's a good opportunity. And if you've got the time, then they have the time. Thank you.
Um, we're intending to sell it as is to a private owner, exactly as it is. Um, I don't know if we can put any kind of restrictions on it, uh, but we certainly don't have any intentions. I mean, we plan on splitting it off. It's about 8.8 acres and selling it to a private person. And there being no other people from the public that want to talk, well, basically, your part is over. <laughs> We're going to have our discussion here and we'll go from there. Do you have any uh, comments? Frank, one question would be the impact of the, the lot down there um, and the scope of that lot. Um, if, if the board so desired to conditionally consider conditional approval, how could they do so and how could they do so with that lot? Uh, the conditional approval would be that 25 would have to be modified to meet the current subdivision regulations, which in essence would require a 25 foot front end. Is that something that I, I don't I, I don't want the board to step outside of their purview? Is that something that is I feel like it's doable because we have an existing lot. I don't think it's it's one thing that I just don't want them to step outside of their purview. Is what I mean. I feel comfortable with that. You say condition upon it having twenty five feet. Okay, gotcha. That the the the, the, the lot twenty five would need to be either modified to basically that lot twenty five would have to be modified. To provide 25 foot of yardage on a publicly dedicated to be conformed. Yeah, to be conformed. Exactly. Now, one way to meet that condition would be to eliminate it. I was just going to say you could demo the house. I mean, that, that's certainly an option. From a conditional standpoint as well, Frank, is this something we need to consider at this time? If, if, if once again, if this was considered for approval, should considerations be detailed and associated with the tree commission approval? Absolutely. It, it, like exactly how they had, they had indicated that that reflects what's contingent upon the tree commission uh, review. I just wanted to put that out there for our planning commission members if this is considered that, that, that those are things that, that we need to make as part of the motion that we consider. Are there any items from that we're, that we're uncomfortable with that we can, it may be stage two, but we want to see something more on them now, stage one, before we do anything with this? Frank did the primary review. Is there any other thoughts that you have that would would warrant this to come back to the Planning Commission, or would it be all staff review? I, I feel like it would be more engineering and things that would be staff review, in my opinion. I agree with that. No real surprises. You don't think going into phase two? No. On the water part of it, a lot of water? No, I mean, uh, again, the, the stormwater component, the city will review the stormwater component, but the, but the regulatory agency for the stormwater is SM1. Okay. I, I just had a couple of questions. I, I think somebody in the audience asked this earlier. Is, is your earthwork generally balanced, do you think, at this time? Oh, yes, we try everything we possibly can do to balance it. Otherwise, it's just costing us money. Uh, can you yeah. explain what that means to you? Uh, yeah, so anywhere where you have to dig out dirt, we want to find some place on site to put it back. So we don't want to be moving dirt on and off site. Uh, you know, during construction, I'm not saying there's got to be not going to be any dirt moved on and off site. Uh, sometimes you bring in loads of topsoil. Sometimes when they dig a foundation, they have to take out, but no massive amounts of dirt are going to be moved on or off site. Um, and that's another reason why um, you know, the area of the detention 
retention pond you know, can be adjusted or modified to sort of balance things out. Yeah, I think that would be much more impactful if they were if they were going on to the, the areas of significant hillside. Because if we were on significant hillsides, that's when you're bringing in a lot of dirt, you're moving a lot of dirt, um, and, and they're staying kind of on that ridge there. That, that, that massive amount of vehicles coming in for just moving dirt likely would not happen. Our engineers definitely have the mandate to balance the site. <laughs> uh, that's always the case, <laughs> whether it works or not. Um, do you anticipate them lighting along the street? Yeah, we, so we uh, so we'll use uh, it's served by Duke, so we'll have Duke lighting. You know, typically it's not too intense. It's standard Duke lighting that is has shields to cast all light down. We only put probably one at the intersection, one every 250 to 300 feet. So I would only anticipate probably three or four street lights on it, but it's more just for sort of a lot of those safety on that road. Um, do you plan to have any kind of gateway walls or? Um... We'll have an entry monument uh, for this lot. You know, we typically try to keep it a little more intimate. Um, it's what the homeowners want, and at the end of the day, that's all being maintained and paid by an HOA. So uh, we want to, uh, you know, again, make it inviting, and that's our sort of sale point. So we want to make it look good from the road. And then I guess my, my last question is, that, I don't know, don't have to make your point here, but the lot, the, the lot where the pond is, the flag lot at the, the end of the cul-de-sac, is that, so that, that whole lot there would be by that one So, house. yeah, technically that lot would be owned by that house. We'll put a HOA maintenance easement on that pond to control it, and actually, depending on what it, how it turns out, SD1 will have easements on it as well to maintain and control the uh, structures. So I think you mentioned it earlier, there's a, an agreement, a development agreement that we signed that gets, then gets transferred over to the HOA that ensures that that's maintained properly. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if you were gonna carve out kind of a separate common lot. Yeah, I think it goes back to the slide lot issue and if we have two contiguous slide lots and that's all we can have and so uh, that needs to be part of that lot with an HOA maintenance easement and it sort of tackles it the same way. Kevin, I'm going to hear sidewalk both sides of this tree. Where are those sidewalks going to be on Newman? Do we have connection on Newman all the way up to Churchill? Is there a sidewalk? I don't think there is. I, I don't think there is on that side. I don't think there's sidewalk. Well, on the other, the other side, Kevin? Um, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, let me see if I can answer that. Look on my phone. There is a sidewalk on the development side. Okay. Yeah, if there's a side, if there's a sidewalk there, and you want us to put sidewalks across the frontage, we'll put sidewalk across the frontage. Yeah, usually we have across the frontage. Yeah, they can be any corner Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, if there wasn't, we would we would ask them to put it across the frontage of Newman uh, to as part of our regulation. going to be an HOA document. Does the city want to see the HOA document? I know we've asked for that. Before. To see kind of a model, what it's what covered in. Yeah, we can submit, we'll submit a, uh, a draft of the HOA documents. It'll be, it won't be finalized until it's actually platted and final, but we'll submit a draft to the city. Very interested in what kind of things are in there. Sure. And our standard HOA documents, um, you know, they, the HOA controls how the garbage can be put out, you know, sheds and backyards, um, you know, you can't keep the trash out on the roads, things like that. So it's pretty standard. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Design wise, we're looking at maybe brick fronts and side room on the sides of these houses or? Um, yeah, Decks on the back but, um, you know, again, it's, it's uh, usually based on the customers, uh, what they want. And typically, not a lot of our customers right now aren't putting brick and stone. They're more uh, putting party board 
uh, a lot of the craftsman style or country style houses. Um, so they'll ask for hardy board, but again, we're talking about a price point that's 700 to 800,000. So uh, it's going to be probably a little, little higher degree than, than uh, you know, some other homes that are starting at that $300,000 to $400,000 range. So the front side, you have to pull in if you will. Yeah, sure. Sides have less volume. Yes. Yes. Definitely. yes. Very close together, like down the road. Easy to me there. Those are two story houses that are too close together to fit our codes, but they're closer than I like to see. Right. And that's what happens when the price of property is so high. Yeah. yeah. And do we have a do we have decks on the back for a lot of I don't know what you're looking at if you have a deck. Seems like everybody wants a deck. If there's there's a door on the back, there's a deck there. Um, at the end of the day, we're providing our, our models of homes and it's all up to the customer what they want to what they want to choose. Um, you know, it's like you said, two-story houses. Most of our customers right now are building ranch houses. It's a uh, 85 foot wide lots. They're they're going to build you know a wide lot. A lot of them will like you know on the 100 foot lots. I'd say they put side entry garages because again, it's it's that's that's sort of the price point we're looking at. I think 700, 700, 800 pounds. Are there any, uh, other than the sanitary issues that we mentioned before, are there any other utilities that's on the property existing? Um, I'd have to go back and look. I don't, I do not think so. Uh -oh. And again, the, the one, the one comment about the sanitary to go back to that, we're tying in, uh, so you can see lot 11, 12, 13, 14, there's a sanitary that sort of heads down the hill. We're tying in right in the middle of the site there. And SD1, uh, we request capacity, they do the study, and they give us capacity. If there's not capacity there, then we don't move forward. So yeah, I just wasn't sure if there were any gas or sure. No, there's no gas or transmission lines through it. Electric's underground? Electric will be underground. Is there any opportunity, you know, we always hear green space, green space, pass. It's an HOA, so sometimes we've seen pass that yeah, go there, around. There is, and quite frankly, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a stick, you know, with this being straight zoning and not being a, a planned unit development. Um, again, these are properties that are owned by individual owners. So any paths would be going through an individual owner. It's certainly something we can explore and see if there's maybe a way to do that. But, uh, you know, with this size, you know, it's uh, with this size community, they may have access back to in and around the pond. It's just it's something we need to get further into the detail to see really what's kind of left and what's realistic. And uh, with 20, 24 homes, uh, we also don't want to drive up yearly, monthly HOA prices uh, for people that tend to want to use you know, the city's you know, paths. They're moving for Thomas. If you made it walk down the street and down the call sack, you lead off to the attention yeah, yeah. I would just like to add, uh, if the planning commission does move forward with any kind of decision, just confirming with the applicant that they want to move forward with that additional condition. Well, I'm talking about, yeah. yeah. I'm comfortable with that condition in all likelihood. The house is going to be taken out, uh, but I'm comfortable with that condition. to approve the stage one development plan for the 
uh, what's it called? Grace Fort Thomas site uh, for, uh, that was presented to us tonight with the conditions that they uh, get through the tree commission and satisfy them, and that somehow the lot at 25, 25, 25 main, and lot 25 main either has a 25 foot frontage developed or uh, is left as the home lot or the building is demolished. Somehow, I don't think we can approve a new lot that doesn't, that's not before. So somehow or other, we have to make that okay. Basically, the lot 25 will not be created unless it can be made before we do this. Jerry, are you also making a request that the sidewalks uh, go across the front each and connect up with public sidewalks? I thought somebody said there already was sidewalks. Yeah. That's what's going to say. Okay. They can go across the front. We don't know if they connect. They don't they can't make them. Connect. Yeah, I was talking about connecting. Well, yeah, I think obviously we want to take the second. That third move and second that we approve this uh, stage one development plan in DO2 2022. Take the property off of Newman Avenue. We move and second. All in favor? Uh, uh, Mr. Brandy, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dan? Uh, Mr. Payoff, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I always do that. Too chat. Um, just as a matter of procedure, would you like to ask the, the board for any further discussion? That's typically done after a, after a motion and a second. Any further discussion? No. Dr. says no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Thank you for your attendance. We you say you're invited to stay. Are we going to proceed with one of those other comprehensive plan updates or not? I think we should at least have a conversation, you know, initiate. I don't know how far we're going to get or how okay. far we'll be we doing that tonight. You can come back on future meetings for the same thing. After five minutes, we got meeting.